Hey folks, when's an HD 7870 not really a 7870? Well, when it should have been branded an HD 7930 of course. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of the most unique offerings from AMD's first generation GCN architecture. This is the HD 7870 XT, a card which I just paid £50 for on auction and it's turned out to be a little bit of a bargain, although it is rare, so if you can find one, you should probably snap it up. Now I have in previous videos covered the HD 7870 and its namesakes, the 270X and 370X, which were all based on the same Pitcairn GPU, the same GPU as is found in Sony's PlayStation 4. Today the Pitcairn GPU it still puts up a good fight and in my opinion it's still worth considering if you can find one for the right price. But the problem with Pitcairn is that it always paled in comparison to its bigger brother, the Tahiti based 7970, the poster child for fine wine technology across subreddits worldwide. So when at the tail end of 2012 AMD released the XT variant of the 7870 to supersede the already well received Gigahertz edition and combat Nvidia's Kepler based GTX 670, there was a little bit of confusion when checking the specs. No longer Pitcairn based, the XT was now based on the Tahiti GPU, just like the 7970 and 7950, but with a further reduction in shader cores and memory bus. Basically, if any GPUs here didn't make the grade for the Tahiti XT, which is found in the 7970, or even the Tahiti Pro, which is found in the 7950, they could still possibly be used as a Tahiti LE. The HD 7930, sorry, 7870 XT. Confused? Well, don't be moving away from the kind of convoluted birth. The 7870 XT was actually a good step up from the old 7870 GHz edition, with 1536 shader cores, which was up considerably from the 1280 shaders on the old GHz card. The card still retained a 2GB frame buffer on that 256-bit memory bus, but the clock speeds of the memory they also got a boost as well, with frequency being raised by 300MHz, giving an effective speed of around 6GHz compared with the 4.8 of the Pitcairn based cards. The core clocks on this GPU were shipped slightly lower than the GHz edition with the boost clock only coming in at 975MHz, but since the card was a Tahiti based GPU and featured less cores which helped keep it cooler than say the 7950, overclocking was the order of the day here. For this Club 3D Joker card, the boost clocks could be raised considerably up to 1.2GHz and the memory speed up to an effective speed of 6.4GHz. So coupling the HD 7870XT with the Core i5-4590 and 8GB of DDR3 RAM, the first test for the game was Prey. Now this is a CryEngine game, so it typically favours Nvidia hardware, but the 7870 basically took it in its stride. Its stop clocks were averaged almost 80fps, and the average minimums were hovering above 40. Now the overclock here certainly helped, the average actually jumped up to closer to 90 FPS and the average minimums jumped up again by an insane amount and almost hit 60 FPS. It should be noted though that when booting this card, especially at the high settings with only 2GB of VRAM, there is quite a fair bit of texture popping for the first 5-10 seconds or so, but once everything is in there, the gameplay was smooth and thoroughly enjoyable. Keeping trying to punish this card, we're on Rise of the Tomb Raider at 1080p on high with FXAA and no tessellation. At stock clocks, we're averaged out 55 FPS, with the average minimums hovering about 40. Overclocking again here helped considerably, and the average frame rate jumped up to 62 FPS, and the average minimums settled comfortably in the mid 40s. Now we all know that Rise of the Tomb Raider, it's a pretty demanding game, so for a card this old to be able to perform like this at high settings, it's fairly impressive. But if you would like to see that minimums jump up to 60, dropping the details down to medium rather than high provides you with an almost locked 60 FPS experience. Jumping into the campaign at Battlefield 1 and running everything at 1080p on the high preset, it was again a very impressive showing. At stock clocks, the HD 7870XT returned 63 FPS on average, with the minimums settling down at 46 FPS. Overclocking again here helped us eke out a few extra frames here, although it wasn't anything like as impressive as seen with Prey. The average, however, did jump up to 67 FPS and the minimum settled just below 50. 
The final test we've got here is Crisis 3. Again, 1080p, high preset, FXAA turned on, and 16 times anisotropic filtering. And its stock clocks, the HD7870 XT, averaged 55 FPS. The average minimums here were 41. And just like in the previous games, overclocking certainly helped here. We managed to bump the average frame rate up to 60 FPS, and the average minimum settled comfortably in the mid 40s. So, to be perfectly honest with you, it's a really impressive result all around, especially when you consider what I actually paid for this card fully boxed. Realistically, I think the name HD 7870 in this particular card is a tad misleading. It was expected when AMD announced it was going to be releasing a Tahiti LE based graphics card that it was going to be the 7930, which, while rare, was not something new. Think back to the HD 5800 series. It featured a 5830, a 5850 and a 5870. But overall, I'm really glad that AMD released this Tahiti based 7800 series as it makes for an interesting side note in what can usually be a generally predictable and quite boring GPU lineup. And I'm just a little bit disappointed that it didn't get much more exposure. You never really see these cars being benchmarked online or recommended on forums, and the performance of it is actually really, really good. It's certainly got to be faster than your normal 7870 GHz edition. It's also got to be faster than the majority of 270Xs and 370Xs. And when overclocked, the performance is actually coming really close to what I experienced at stock clocks on my old R9280X. Now we've all seen the price of them shoot up with the cryptocurrency boom, and so far the HD7870 XT, it seems to have managed to sneak past those that are wanting a GCN architecture card. The performance is very similar to a 7950 or a 280 and the price is generally lower. I've seen a few of them on eBay go over the last few weeks for pretty similar prices to what I paid for mine. And I'll remind you, it was only £50, and to be perfectly honest with you, that's not that much more than I paid for that GTX 750 that I tested a few weeks back. So there's only been a few games benchmarked here today, and the reason for that is that when we were overclocking, the temperatures were hitting a bit higher than I would have hoped for, but this card, it's never been opened before. It's still got the warranty seal on the back of it, and the fans and heatsink look pretty clogged up to me, so we're definitely going to strip this card back in the future and probably break out the old GTX 1050 Ti and see how it holds up to a modern budget card in a much more extensive line of games. But anyway folks, I hope you've enjoyed this quick look back at this kind of unique 7800 series card and I hope that you'll stick around and see how it's going to fare against that fabled GTX 1050 Ti. I'd honestly love to know if any of you guys have ever seen this card, if you've got a Tahiti LE based card, and what you think of it, if you're still running it in 2017, or if you've already upgraded to something faster. But that's it for me folks, as always take care, and I'll see you all in the comment section down below, and in the next video.